Our next speaker for the afternoon is Taegyu Khan from Dr. Ranjan's group, and he will be speaking about supercritical CO2 advanced energy conversion. Hi, <coughs> my name is Taegyu Khan. I'm in Dr. Ranjan's group. Uh, my topic is a supercritical CO2 as an advanced energy conversion fluid. So the motivation of this study is uh, every year uh, required energy consumption is increasing and to fulfill this uh, increased requirements, we don't want to increase the fossil fuel thinking about environment. What we want to do is uh, we want to increase the renewable energy resources. And we're going to focus on that and how do we use renewable resources? There can be many ways, but one, one of the, uh, the methods is we use uh, renewable resources to heat and using that heat uh, to run the um, cycle. Uh, we focus on supercritical CO2 cycle and we heat the CO2 and using that CO2 to run the turbine and we, we get electricity. And as you can see, like, it's transporting heat to electricity. And that's why we use uh, heat, uh, heat exchanger. And there can be many ways to improve the cycle efficiency. But this time, we're going to focus on improving heat exchanger to improve the cycle efficiency. And I will uh, explain how it connected to that way. So I said supercritical CO2. And what is a supercritical CO2? Um, obviously, it's going to be a supercritical region, and one of the characteristic of this supercritical CO2 is around the critical region, the thermal properties are changing drastically. Uh, and one another um, thing we need to remember is the density around the supercritical point. Uh, it's really high, and that's also one of the benefits we are using supercritical CO2. And then why supercritical CO2? There can be many supercritical fluids, such as uh, water, helium, CO2. But if you see this, it's depending on the temperature, the cycle efficiency can be changing. And you can see over around like 50% cycle efficiency, the steam cannot reach there, but CO2 or helium can be there. But for example, helium, if you want to go around the 50% cycle efficiency, it needs to go really high temperature. It is very challenging to make that cycle. So um, that's why there is a benefit using supercritical CO2. And another thing is, it's just supercritical fluids at around the room temperature. And as I mentioned here, Around the critical point, supercritical CO2 has really high density. Because of that, the turbine machinery, if steam, steam turbine is this big, the supercritical CO2 turbine will be this big. And helium for helium will be this big. So this is a saving a lot of space and also capital cost making this turbine. So one of the application was uh, using this supercritical cycle for a nuclear submarine so that they have a lot of space limit, as small as possible, like it would be benefit for them. So that was one of the benefit. Um, this is one of the optimized the super, super critical cycle. Uh, this is application for, application is for nuclear power plant. Um, for nuclear power plant, the maximum temperature goes only up to 550 degrees C and everything will be in supercritical region, which means um, like steam um, ranking cycle equals the two phase. So handling that is really difficult. So cycle will be very compli complicated. But for this one, it's, everything is in one phase. So making this, uh, we don't need to worry about two phase flow or those things. Um, application for supercritical CO2 cycle um, it's a geothermal concentrated solar power and waste recovery or nuclear power plant. Uh, we're going to focus on these two today. So, um, 
why then improving that cycle efficiency, why do you want to talk about heat exchanger mainly? Because 80% heat input to cycle is from internal recuperation. And only 20% of energy input is from external heat sources. So as uh, we increase the heat exchanger performance, then we save a lot of energy from there. Uh, there can be many uh, options for heat exchanger. For this case, heat exchanger can be very small because the specific heat is very high. Um, but we consider manufacturing uh, of the heat exchanger and according to the manufacturing technique, the, uh, this heat exchanger strength will degrade. And considering all of that, uh, printed circuit heat exchanger is one of the, the best candidates. Then what is printed circuit heat exchanger? It's basically on the plate, you chemical etch the channel, and you put another plate and diffusion bond them, and they form full channel. And you stack them up for um, some channel for hot fluid, some channel for cold fluid. Uh, for this printed circuit heat exchanger, <coughs> depending on the channel geometry, hydraulic performance or thermal performance will drastically change it. Uh, there can be some uh, previous studies about zigzag airflow or um, offset field, rectangular offset field. Um, the typical, uh, typical, expert, typical way to do experiment to figure out detailed performance of this heat exchanger is uh, we, reach, uh, we divide this heat exchanger in 10 sections and we um, individually cool each section with water. So by doing that, from water information, we can calculate heat transfer rate at each section and we, we combine this heat transfer information with outer surface water temperature of the heat exchanger, we can back calculate actual fluid temperature at each point. This is very important information to size your heat exchanger properly. If you, if you make this heat exchanger very really long, then it will be nice that um, you will have enough, uh, enough length to transfer heat, but we also need to think about the the cost to manufacture the heat exchanger and material cost. So based on that uh, experiment, uh, we can calculate heat transfer rate. For zigzag channel, it has highest uh, heat transfer rate, and uh, straight channel is the bottom, and therefore is between them. But zigzag is also um, top for pressure loss. This is very important. Um, although it has high state transfer rate, if this <coughs> pressure drive is really high, then it directly affects uh, to cycle efficiency. As you increase the pressure drop, the cycle efficiency will be also drop. So this is a huge dis disadvantage. Um, th these studies are basically for uh, relatively low temperature, 650 degrees C. But what, what about if we can go higher temperature, such as like 10, 1,000 uh, Kelvin? Uh, then this will give more um, increased uh, efficiency. And as I mentioned, we want to um, make this uh, concentrated solar power plant uh, to be marketable. Then for that, because consider solar power plant, it will go higher temperature, such as 1,000 Kelvin. We need to have heat exchanger, which can go that high temperature. Then what is concentrated uh, solar power plant? So basically, we put a lot of mirror, and we, we reflect and focus to the top of the tower. And top of the tower, there is a molten salt or some other fluid that can go high temperature. And it goes down, and it transfer heat to the supercritical CO2. And using the supercritical CO2, we run the turbine and we generate the electricity. This is typical cycle for um, a concentrated solar power plant. There are two different heat exchangers here. One is a recuperator. The other one is a heat exchanger 
uh, to transport heat from molten salt to uh, spoketic CO2. And we're going to focus on this because this is really extreme condition. This heat exchanger needs to handle this high temperature and also high pressure because spoketic pressure of the CO2 will be very high. Um, there, are some, there are many challenges to make this heat exchanger. One of them is the material strength. You can see material strength will be dropping very drastically at around 650 degrees C. Only few materials are going to handle this high pressure after that uh, temperature. Another thing is at this high temperature, the corrosion effect is really low. So uh, many, many materials have been studied. And as you can see, um, material hands to dirty is really handling well on this corrosion. Uh, not just that. So we have material which can handle this high pressure and high temperature and also good for corrosion. But what if it's really expensive? It's not economically uh, feasible to make uh, using this material to make this heat exchanger. Um, this is about how we can optimize the cost and material strength and those things. So, Considering all three, three points, uh, there are two candidates. One is using hands to dirty material to make the heat exchanger, or we use a ceramic heat exchanger. This is composite of metal and ceramic. So first, hands to dirty. This is uh, similar to the conventional stainless steel heat exchanger. We add channel and we diffusion bond. But here is the problem. When we diffusion bond this, we need to apply a lot of pressure and also a lot of, uh, like, a lot of heat. We need, it need to be very high temperature. And we need to apply those things for a long time. As you apply that uh, pressure and temperature for a long time, that bonded area will be um, <coughs> maximized. So initially, you have this much gap, and it will be reduced. And eventually, it is fully diffusion bonded, or you will have some small cavity. Um, but although this is 100% area bonded, uh, it doesn't mean it's performing like a raw material strength. It's actually maximum is 89%. So we cannot expect that uh, actual material strength. It's actually degraded. And applying that much heat and pressure for a long time, it, we are talking about 40 hours. It's a lot of money to, a lot of money. So, which means manufacturing fee for this heat exchanger will be very high. So, then next uh, option. Uh, the name is, uh, so this is a composite material of a ceramic and metal. Uh, the name is uh, zirconia carbide with tungsten. You basically, um, okay, so I'll talk about how to make later, but uh, at high temperature, the material strength is very high. And also conductivity of this uh, material is uh, 2.5 times more than um, conventional metal, like stainless steel or high temperature alloy, such as this hands to dirty. So this is a very good material to make high temperature heat exchanger. How to make it? First, you mold uh, with the tungsten carbide. You can machine or you can mold, you can do both. And you put uh, zirconia copper powder and you apply heat and pressure for like 30 minutes. Then you have zirconia carbide tungsten heat exchanger. Uh, you can see, like, this is not that complicated, but relatively it's complicated shape. Uh, it shows like it can make channels. It can also make some complicated shape as well. Um, but there is a one problem with this material. It has corrosion effect. It, it gets corroded by uh, CO2. So one way is we can coat with the copper or nickel. Or in our case, we put this um, zirconia carbide tungsten heat exchanger in the copper block and we put another copper block above it, and then we can run the CO2 in it. You can see, by doing that, um, the corrosion effect is not that serious. 
so this is one of the prototypes that we are testing right now. Uh, this is copper, which, which is going to be above on the GTS zirconia uh, carbide tungsten heat exchanger. Um, this is hand study uh, because the, the other loop will be high temperature alloy. The other loop is not a serious condition, it's not high temperature as a uh, heat exchanger. So we can use that. Um, there are two ways to uh, make this heat exchanger. So on the GIS tungsten, we put this copper top. Um, one way is, is diffusion bonding, copper to copper, but the other way is we can use EDM welding. Um, this can penetrate really deep, and this is a magnified <coughs> image of that welding, which is really, uh, you can see it's re weld really well. So currently we are testing 